Hey everybody, Darren Oros here. Today I'm with my good friend, Nick Scalcos. Nick and I met a couple of years back. I was traveling across North America speaking for an organization called Keyspire. And Nick was a part of my team early on and has, was an integral part of the team as I traveled for those three or four years across North America. I'm so excited that he's here today to talk about his journey from purchasing residential properties to then going to looking at larger buildings, commercial residential, six units or more. Nick is, Nick is gonna walk us through the journey on how he was able to make that transition. Before we get into it with Nick, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel. You can also hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. Without further ado, let's get into it. Nick Scalco, it's great to have you here, my friend. Why don't you give us a little bit of a background on who you are and what you do as a real estate investor? Thanks for having me. I love your show, by the way. I share it all the time. I think it's full of info. I really appreciate you having me here. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Nick Skalkos. You may uh, recognize me as the drummer of the miniatures or spirits. I've also done work with uh, City and Color and Len. Three years ago, I was producing music, but I decided that um, I wanted to go see Scott McGilvery uh, do this presentation. He was talking about how he invests in real estate and I was a big fan of income property. I myself had a bungalow. I was thinking of converting it as well. So that show really resonated with me. Went to see him talk. I was convinced that you know real estate was for me, so I started. Um, I started with uh, converting my existing bungalow into a duplex. My wife and I would live in the basement, and we'd rent up the upstairs, get it legally duplexed, and uh, continue the process. I now have um, three passive investments in the Windsor Chatham area. There's sixplex, fourplex, a triplex. As you just mentioned, I'm starting to get into commercial real estate investing. And uh, there are, you know, there are a lot of differences between the two. Um, and uh, I wouldn't mind just kind of going over them with you today. Walk us through the, the process. Um, you know, when you decided to make that switch from, you know, looking at bungalows, duplexes, triplexes, going to the sixplex, going to whatever is next for you. First of all, how did you find the property? Okay, so I was on an airplane. I'm in Calgary, Alberta. Beside me was uh, my future JV partner who I had never met before. He realized that I was uh, a real estate investor as well. And we started talking about this property in St. John, New Brunswick. I never considered St. John, New Brunswick before, but the numbers were crazy. And I loved this guy. He was really cool. And those numbers were, were nuts. There was a six flex for 170 that we were looking at. 170,000 for six units? Yeah. For, yeah, and this is the one we ended up buying, by the way. Yeah. So we're looking at this property. Uh, by the time- how did, the, how did he find out about it, Nick? Like what was, how did this property come across his desk? MLS, MLS. Okay. Now, you know, we, we have realtors that give us pocket listings, but sometimes, you know, like this property was on the market for six years. It, <laughs> it, it had it gone through a, a sale that went through. Someone tried to buy it and the sale went through. So the owners were just desperate to get rid of it. You know, they were- Sale went through as in fell through? Like they, sorry, it fell through. Sorry, yeah. yeah. So someone tried to acquire it, fell through. There were tons of investors that checked it out and just passed on it because the work was too, too much. Yeah. Um, and uh, the current owners were halfway through the renovation when they just, just decided just to get rid of it. We found this house for 170. We countered at 140 and we know that they rejected low ball offers, but we went in anyway. They countered with 158. We came back at 145 and they accepted. So, so were you working with an agent here, Nick? Like, were you, so, did you have, yeah, did you have so, an agent representing you or did you just kind of go and were you working with the agent directly? So even though we found the property ourselves, we did work with a realtor. Our realtor was negotiating all of this on, on behalf of us. Yeah. Uh, asking price 170. It went back and forth. We got it back down to, we got it down to 145. They agreed to 145 and we did our due diligence and right at the last minute, right when the offer was about to close, I called up Trevor and I said, let's, uh, this place is a disaster. It's not soundproof properly. I want to drop in another $20,000 or we're going to walk away from the deal. What was the motivation for making that last minute uh, adjustment? And I'm guessing you're still in the conditional period because you can't drop the price once you've agreed on a sale price. You can't go in like days before you're taking possession of the property and say, we're gonna pay $20,000 less. That's right, right. We're still, under the still in the conditional period. So before yeah. you're signing off on um, 
your conditions, this is what you're talking about, right? Where you're talking about dropping that price, but how did you know to renegotiate right before you decided to sign off? Well, I knew that this problem was there initially. I just didn't bring it up until the last minute. And the reason why I brought it up in the last minute is because I know that mentally they had sold the property to us. Mm. And I know that they had wanted to get rid of this for a long time. I was just the bad cop, you know, it's just the real person. Like, yeah, this, this guy in Ontario, like he doesn't want the deal anymore unless you drop it. This rock star from Ontario is trying to <laughs> right? beat us down on the price. <laughs> and they just, they kind of had to just say, yeah. They had to say yeah. yes. So we brought it down to 125. It was crazy. Actually, we got it for 123.5 because our realtor further got a $1,500 deduction. I don't know how he did that, but he pushed it even further. So that <laughs> so was awesome. One, as part of your due diligence, I'm guessing, when you were looking at acquiring this property, I'm guessing it needed significant renovation because of the, you know, the fact that it sat on the market for so long. Uh, what was the state of the property at that point? Was there tenants in there? Was, was it occupied? Was it partially occupied? What was the state of the, the, the existing building as you took it over? This is hilarious. <laughs> the state of the building was vacant and it was so derelict and so bad that Sarah and I had received a letter from the city of St. John asking us to tear it down or do something with it. It was a danger to the public. I've so never was almost <laughs> condemned basically. Yeah, like I've never took, I've never taken possession of a property like that where the city was like, do something like, <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, <laughs> this is crazy. It was, it was really bad, man. There was engineering issues. The roof was sagging. There was mold issues. There was, uh, you know, engineer, uh, structural issues left and right, which resulted in um, us going way over budget. <laughs> <laughs> so what was... <laughs> What was the renovation budget that you guys came up with that you thought was going to take to get this property up and running? So we did a, we, I flew up to St. John. I did a walkthrough with our contractor, with my partner, Trevor, who lives in Hamilton. Sorry, Halifax. Yeah. A uh, four hour drive from St. John. We did the walkthrough. The contractor was confident that the entire scope of work was going to cost $100,000. <laughs> and I'm like, really, man? <laughs> This is cool, this New Brunswick. Everything's so cheap out here. It's amazing. 100,000. Wow. You should have called me. <laughs> Darren. <laughs> Darren. Oh Even the God. first two issues you mentioned, I could have been like, it's more than $100,000, my friend. Dude, it was awful. And our contractor is so positive. He's like, I can do this for 100,000, you know? So when it, when it got, when the renovation got out of hand, he was like, hey, 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 I told you I can do it for 100,000. I didn't say, I was going to cover the electrical and the plumber and I didn't know all these structural issues were going to come and, you know, and it's not, and we're just like, wow, okay, this is crazy. So, uh, so what was, what were some of the issues on the property? You, you mentioned there was the, the sagging roof, there was some mold. What were the other things you were dealing with? There was work previously done on this house that the city had issues with. So mm -hmm the previous owners were supposed to sign off on all these problems, like, like the, all these permits are done, all these the, like plumbing, electrical, and the city's contesting that it wasn't, you know? So we had to get the old structural engineer to come back and be like, well, why wasn't this finished? What's going on? Uh, it ended up being like $30,000 in structural improvements that we weren't expecting. And this mm -hmm. is before any, any, anything even started, you know, it's just beams, foam, spray foam, uh, roof, stuff like that. Um, and then from there, you know, then that was, uh, okay, now let's go. Let's start the renovation. Let's go back to, to financing. I want to talk about that quickly and then we'll jump into the reno because I want to hear sure. the story about how the renovation progressed. So you obviously bought the property for 123. You were about $100,000 you were expecting for the reno. Did you come up with private financing at that point? How did you acquire the building and what was the process there when financed? Yeah, uh, you know, last thing you want, you, you can't just put a down payment on a vacant sixplex that's dilapidated. <laughs> that's right? condemned. So, yeah. Right? So, yeah, so Trevor and I found private money. So, what we did is we used our forums, our networking, and what we did is we posted our deal on these forums looking for private money. So, we secured the property and then we went out and found the money. I know a lot of people like to find the money first and then secure the property, but this is how we did it. We got three loans. One okay. major loan was a, was secured under the property. Yeah. And then the other two separate loans were promissory note loans. Cool. Do you mind disclosing the values of those two and the interest yeah, not rates at all. you were paying? Not at all. So the, uh, so the secured loan was 170000 
And the promissory loans, there was two of them for 50,000 each. And were the interest rates similar on the two or were they a little different? They were. Um, it was like 12% plus 2% fee. I think there, everything was 14%. In the case of the loan that was secured on the property, the funds got released during certain stages of the renovation, which I found a bit confusing and uh, annoying at times. I mean, we so from your that. private lender, they were releasing funds as you went? That's right. So from the, the private loan that was secured on the property, we didn't get that lump sum. Like initially, it was just kind of released as in stages. Yeah, well, it makes sense, right? I mean, if you look at the numbers, you know, if you were buying the property for 123000 Mm -hmm. As a lender, if, it, if I was lending you the money, I'm like, you don't need 170, even though I'm willing to lend that to you throughout the process. I'm not going to give you $170,000 on a property you just paid 123000 for. So I'm guessing yeah. they gave you the money to acquire the building. And then as you were going through the renovation, they released funds throughout that. I mean. The private lender that had the secure loan, that had the uh, loan secured on the property, wanted uh, as is appraisal in addition to an after repair value appraisal. So she wanted as is appraisal and a stretch appraisal. What did those uh, come in at? So <laughs> this is hilarious, man. The stretch appraisals were so off. Like it's crazy. Our first stretch appraisal. What was, was the as is appraisal? The as is appraisal luckily came in at uh, at around 200, but I have to double check my books on that. Mm -hmm. The uh, stretch appraisals though were funny. Uh, the first one came in at 270. And then we asked the guy to like reevaluate it. We were like 270 after repair, after we renovate the sixplex. Brand, it's gonna come in at 270, are you kidding me? And he re then he's like, okay, 350. <laughs> I'm like, okay, 350, right. First it comes in at 270, then it comes in at 350. So we're like, okay, 350. If it comes in at 350 and the renovation is only going to be $100,000, yeah. we're good. We're this great. Yeah. You know, the plan was to use other people's money, acquire this property, and I have none of our money in, which is yeah. absolutely not what happened. <laughs> That's not what happened at all. Okay. All right. I love this story, man. This is so good. Okay, so you get the property, you acquire it, you're, you're, you're $30,000 into the structural engineering, which is like your first hurdle. What's the next thing that comes up in the renovation process? Because I'm guessing the way you're talking about the relationship with the contractor, it didn't go as smoothly as you'd hoped it would go. What we were noticing is that, uh, is that whenever there was a change order, normally a contractor would go through that with, with us, uh, he would just go ahead and, and do the change. We didn't have an opportunity to get other quotes for the job. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't send us pictures uh, prior to doing the job. So we have no proof if he actually did the job. Uh, so this started to cost us money. You know, he'd be like, my guys were in here for 12 hours longer than I thought they were going to be. And we're just like, man, you gave us a quote and now we're paying you by the hour. Like what's going on here? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so things started to get out of hand, right? We didn't have anything signed to contract. So <clears throat> basically we had to plow through, we had to pay for it. And Trevor, oh man, he wasn't, he wasn't letting our contractor off the hook for anything. He was just like, you know, this is not cool, you know, and, and things started to get a bit, a bit intense. Uh, me here, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I can't believe this guy is going to fix this place. This place is it dump this place is crazy like he's actually going to attempt to do this like you know i was a bit thankful that someone actually wanted to do this place and he wanted to rip his hair out nights like i just sort of sympathized with the contractor a little bit it was a nightmare to deal with i mean there's nothing to do you got to keep the relationship healthy until the job's done mm -hmm. so that was my goal is pay him what he wants pay him what he's asking for and let's just get it done. And at the end of the day, it wasn't that unreasonable. The place needed so much work. We ended up hiring a contractor to finish the job because we were so concerned that the job wasn't gonna be done in time. We actually got another contractor in to finish the uh, landings, the fire escape, the sidings and stuff. And they did use uh, you know, work order changes and stuff like that in service contracts. So we actually, for a moment, did see how a professional construction company works and their prices were reasonable too. So guess what I'm doing next time? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> how did you find this contractor? Was he a recommendation from somebody else? Yeah. So that, that I'd have to ask Trevor how he found it. I believe that, uh, our contractor was recommended. 
mm. to him. Uh, and then the, the contractor that we got to complete the job was actually affiliated with our uh, property management. What was the tally of the contractor A, let's call him? Um, how far in were you into the budget at that point when he kind of stepped away from the job? And what was the, what was the state of the building at that point? And how, so, what was the timeline? Where were you at in the timeline? We had to finish in February. It was January. We basically locked the doors on our contractor and like, you're out. This new guy's in. He lost it, right? And the contractors don't like that. But uh, he'd been paid for his time. He's been no? paid. Yeah, he's been paid for his time. And we eventually were like, okay, listen, continue doing what you're doing. These guys are going to come in. They're going to do the exterior because clearly you're not going to have that done in time. And that's another thing that, you know, that I really like implore you if you're looking for a JV partner to find someone that's willing uh, to do what Trevor and I did, which is basically this is dig in our own pockets, find the money to get another contractor in to finish the job, do what you got to do to finish your job. Like we never want to go to our private lenders and say, sorry, we didn't do it. Right? Like there's no story. There's no, you're not getting your money back. We got to figure this out. We got to dig into our pockets. We got to make this happen. We got to get this project done. So when, when you're finding a JV partner, make sure you find someone that's willing to sell their property to pay back their private lender, who's willing to go into debt to pay back their private lender. So what was the original timeline? Like how long were you expecting that renovation to take? <laughs> Again, we were expecting that, res that reno uh, renovation to take anywhere from six to eight months. Okay, and that's we a reasonable timeline, I think though. But it is, yeah, it ended up taking 12 months. Yeah. The hundred thousand dollars for eight oh. months of work, they're like, it doesn't add up, right? No, not, not well, definitely not in Ontario. And what was the final tally on the reno? The reno cost, including interest from borrowing private money mm -hmm. and including any carrying cost, yeah, came to like 420. So the <laughs> reno was like 370, everything's 420. Crazy. So you're a little, a little over budget by four times. <laughs> like what the hell? Our, 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 after our stretch repaisal came in at three fifty, we were, we spent four twenty on rentals. Like this. Were you was guys so cool. stressed out at this point? Man, I'm not stressed out. You know me, man. I don't stress. <laughs> um, how much did you smoke at this? Point? <laughs> <laughs> to just be like, everything's fine. I'm everything's chill, good. <laughs> everything's fine. I was calming <laughs> people down, yo. You know. <laughs> Oh my God. Okay. Oh, so, so 420,000 with carrying with everything, Reno, you've acquired the building for 125. So you're basically in for like $550,000 at this point. Yeah. Now you've got right. a completed six unit building. You're saying 12 months later, it, it was basically done. You're putting tenants in place at that point. Is that where you yeah. are? Yeah. So we found tenants relatively easy. The problem was, is that we had two one bedroom apartments that were fully furnished, mm. ready to Airbnb. Mm. And then COVID comes along. <laughs> so we're like, wow, we just paid five grand to furnish, to furnish these two apartments. We're like, okay, maybe we can get 800 for them. Uh, well, our property managers found a company in Montreal that were looking to, uh, to put some staff into some apartment buildings. So we rented them out to some staffers from Montreal for 1350 and the other apartments there's two three bedrooms and four one bedroom and they all got rented at market market rent I know that after our expenses we're we're raking in 1800 in cash flow in cash flow that's nice. like after everything what does the appraisal <laughs> come back at when you guys finish oh my the god building? Darren so we give him our package and he looks at it and he's like whoa you guys are like pretty serious here and we we're just like oh oh man i don't know if this is our guy he's like impressed by our numbers like he should you know so we didn't hear from him didn't hear from him. trevor's like uh i'm like what's going on with the appraisal he's like i'm still waiting i'm like no 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 no. let's get another appraisal man like let's just pay for it so when you said you paid for it so you you were you were gonna you weren't gonna pay the first guy or how like what no we're gonna, gonna pay the first guy was he, he was like commercial I, he was a commercial appraiser though, like, or was he a residential guy that he- What we just... realized is he was a residential guy in right. the process of getting his license or something. For being commercial. Yeah, so he's going to his boss and he's like, what about 300 for an Airbnb? And his boss is like, no, you're an idiot. You know, this guy is actually coming back to us telling me like, my boss called me an idiot for, 
We're just like, wow, this is not cool. Like, so I don't know how Trevor found another appraiser, but we found another appraiser. We sent him our package. And this guy was wicked. He comes back to us and he's like, your vacancy is bang on, your maintenance is low, your, uh, you know, your projected this is too high, your cap rate is fine. And he just went and verified all of our numbers, you know? And we were just like, this is great. Like I would pay for this service, you know, like we were off here, we were on here, we were conservative here. This was great. So he did his math and he came back at 490, bro. <laughs> <laughs> we got 490 man and the first appraiser was still trying to figure it out first appraiser calls us up a couple days ago he's like i'm still trying to work us out trevor's like dude we're signing papers already like right like don't even bother and the guy's like Phew, thanks man like <laughs> my boss was not having it right so we didn't end up paying the first appraiser thankfully he was just like let's just cut our losses and call it quits but when you got your appraisal at 490 um were you now able to go the the to a traditional lender and because now the building is occupied uh were you able to put commercial financing fin commercial residential financing in place yeah so what happened there was our our broker uh the first bite we got they only wanted to give us a 65 percent loan to value because they didn't like the area so what we did is we went to the subway beside the house we were like hey kid tell us about this building here kids like prostitutes man prostitutes <laughs> we're like wow okay trevor calls up the constable of the area of the police force called the police force i'm looking for uh you know a constable that's familiar with this area he gets a cop on the phone and, and trevor's like you know tell me about this address prostitutes man bad area bad area but everybody said that the area was up and coming so that's all we wanted to hear, right? We met our neighbors, they're great. So, I mean, do your due diligence when you're going into an area, find out, ask the kid at the subway, ask the local cop, you know, how many problems have you had at this house? Just mm -hmm. do your due diligence there. So how did you get past the hurdle of the sort of the commercial lender not wanting to go beyond 65% loan to value because of the, the area? Yeah, we went to another lender. Mm -hmm. That's how we got around that. <laughs> <laughs> We went to another lender and uh, it was manual life that ended up uh, showing up. They were like, we'll give you a uh, 75% loan to value. I, I have to talk to my broker to find out how much it was blended, but basically they blended me, Sarah, Trevor and his wife with the cap rate of the building, with the cash flow of the building. Yeah. And I don't know how much of that was blended, but it wasn't an issue like qualifying for the mortgage wasn't as much of an issue as, as it normally is. So if I do my math quickly, uh, 490 was your appraised value. You're getting 75% loan to value. You're about 370 is your mortgage. I'm, I'm thinking. So your private lenders are all paid back. You've now been able to pay for a portion of the renovation. What have you got left in this transaction in terms of capital? Yeah, Trevor and I are still trying to sort that out. We're having the papers are getting signed today. So I should have a clear, uh, a more clear picture of how much, but we're probably, Trevor and I are probably both in it for 70, 75,000 each after we're all paid back. So even if your, if your investment is, you know, 150,000 into the transaction still, and you're making 800, 1800 a month, your cash on cash return is like 12% you know, uh, on a monthly basis, which is great. I mean, if you can make 12% on your money anywhere else, uh, show me where it is and I'll invest in it. Plus, you know, you're getting that mortgage pay down, obviously every single year, you know, like you said it earlier, you can't really bank on the value of this property going up too much in St. John's, New Brunswick. But as you see those neighborhoods transition and as you hold this property longer term, uh, and if that's the plan, is that the plan? Are you planning to hold this for an extended period of time? always always long term what a transaction i love it i love that you're so candid about it too because i think like a lot of investors would be afraid to tell this story afraid to you know admit the mistakes you made because here's the reality we all have made mistakes in real estate investing there's no question about it and i think that if you're open about it and you can learn from those mistakes and apply it to your next transaction obviously that's going to be super helpful in moving forward yeah if you don't learn from your mistakes then you're an idiot like get out <laughs> Yeah. Making mistakes is okay. If you don't learn from them, then you're in trouble, man. 
I love this transaction, Nick, and I, I think that it's turned out okay. You know, in the end, it could have been a lot worse, my friend. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that could have gone really wrong. This could have been foreclosed on. There could have been private lenders not paid back. But I think you're a yeah. guy who is like has got sky high integrity, and I love that you said you would go into debt before you would not see your private lenders paid back. And I think that speaks a lot to your character and who you and Trevor are, obviously. Yeah, Trevor had to do a flip to JV. Our two of our lenders wanted their money back at the deadline we weren't ready yet he had to do a flip to jv i had to do a refinance they mm. were paid back it's fine nick it was so fun to have you on today uh you always make me laugh dude because you are hilarious and i just think that like i say it's it's really um refreshing to see somebody who is um open to sharing their successes and also the things that they've done wrong and learn from those mistakes and move on uh, i'm going to leave your information in the description below i'm also going to we'll link uh the music that you've been writing for scott if people oh. want to check that out you know with that i want to say thanks so much for being here for those of you that enjoyed today's session with nick go ahead and hit that like button below you can also subscribe to my channel hit the notification bell and please feel free to leave comments and questions below for me and for nick you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenvoros.com. With that, I'll say, Nick, I wish you the best of success on your real estate investing journey. I look forward to hearing your future success stories and future hilarious adventures in the real estate investing world. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to be with me here today, and I look forward to chatting with you soon. Thank you, Darren. Appreciate it.